What are vaccines and how do they work? When viruses or bacteria enter the body, our immune cells, also called lymphocytes, produce antibodies to neutralize the effect of these foreign invaders. A healthy individual can produce millions of antibodies a day, which work quite efficiently to keep us healthy and prevent us from becoming sick. However, there is one problem with all of this. A human body can take up to several days to produce an antibody response to defend itself from antigens, or outside invaders, such as viruses and bacteria, which attack the body. In most cases, this will not be a serious issue, except for some nasty bacteria or viruses like whooping cough or measles. In this case, a few days is too long. These bacteria and viruses can spread and kill the person before their immune system can fight back. This is where vaccines come in. So, what are vaccines? Simply put, vaccines are made of dead or weakened antigens. These antigens can't harm the body, but the body's immune police, its antibodies, still see them as an enemy and neutralize them. This process allows our immune system to remember the characteristics of these antigens by developing a memory of them. When the antigens attack the body again, our immune police are ready with the memory and produce antibodies quickly to protect the body. That is why vaccines play a very important role in protecting us from some very harmful disease agents such as measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox or varicella, influenza, polio, hepatitis, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, pneumococcal, zoster, yellow fever, rabies, and human papillomavirus or HPV. What a marvelous day! Nothing gives me more joy than teaching my students about the human body. But since your children aren't vaccinated, it's incredibly unsafe for them to come to school. Oh, sorry. I just believe that vaccines are the parents' choice. And I believe they're unnatural. They're a conspiracy! So instead, I'll be educating you. For though you are grown adults, you all need a lesson in biology. Let the learning begin. Observe. As the measles vaccine enters the bloodstream, the immune system is activated. You see? Those white blood cells are learning how to protect the body from the disease. Sure, you say that, but where's the proof? Where's the evidence? It's literally outside your window. Just turn your heads, you can see it happening. Here in the lungs, the measles virus can attack the respiratory system, which can cause pneumonia. But observe! The vaccine contains a weakened form of the disease, which passes through the body harmlessly. It also contains a ton of toxins. Even mercury. Okay, that's very wrong. Well, decades ago, vaccines contained a non-toxic variant of mercury. Today, they don't contain mercury of any kind. Why do you think that? Because Western medicine says so? No, because this bus can shrink down to the molecular level, and you can watch it happen. Just watch. That one's oxygen, that one is hydrogen, but no mercury. So, oh my, where did she go? I'm healing this body the same way I heal my kids. Crystal therapy. It's a totally safe... <coughs> oh man, that was expensive. <coughs> what on earth are you doing? We gotta take out this vaccine before it gives that kid autism! Where does that happen, by the way? Let's see, that happens... well, nowhere. There's zero evidence that vaccines cause autism or mental disorders of any kind. Do people actually think that? I do. Hi, I'm Jenny McCarthy. Thank goodness nobody important. I'm Chris Christie, and I don't believe in vaccines, and I want to be your next president. Seriously? Got him! <laughs> That's the last one! Why is it getting so hot in here? Without the vaccine, it appears the body is now infected with measles and is suffering from a fever of 103 degrees. Oh dear. Bet you wish I had my crystal now. Orange you glad you don't have scurvy? 
In 1747, in the first medical trial ever performed, Scottish physician James Lind found out that eating citrus fruits could cure scurvy. Now, today we know this works because citrus contains high levels of vitamin C. In fact, ascorbic acid, a common name for vitamin C, comes from the Latin for not scurvy. By issuing rations of lemon juice to sailors, the British Navy was able to pretty much eliminate the disease until the late 1800s, when polar explorers suddenly began to see scurvy again. The copper pots holding their lime juice had destroyed the vitamin C, but they were pretty confused. So despite James Lynn's experiments 150 years before, citrus fruits became the enemy. And when Robert Falcon Scott set out to reach the South Pole in 1911, he carried the finest in canned meat products, biscuits, chocolate, tea, and zero vitamin C. A Norwegian team beat them to the pole by five weeks, and during their sad journey home, Scott and his team perished in a blizzard, sick and weak from what was probably scurvy. It had been so long since anyone had seen this disease, the British had forgotten how to prevent it. When we create such effective solutions, we can forget how serious the problems were. Thankfully, people today don't die of scurvy or polio. Since the introduction of Jonas Salk's polio vaccine in 1955, the disease has been nearly eradicated from the earth. The thing to remember is that this is a continuous process. Compare the 358 infections reported in 2014 to the 1940s, when half a million people per year were paralyzed or died from polio infections. Vaccines work. Our immune system is on constant alert against germy baddies with millions of white blood cells, each on the lookout for specific infections. When an immune cell meets its target, it replicates itself, and this clone army sends a barrage of protein weapons called antibodies to label the trash for cleanup. And after the infection is gone, so-called memory cells stick around, ready to mount a fast attack in case this germ shows up again. This is how we develop immunity, and it works pretty well, you know, since we're all still alive. But even with all that, some super bad germs can take us out before our immune sentries have had time to call up their clone army. This is especially true for young children. Their immune systems are fresh out of basic training. Thankfully, we have vaccines, which are made of tiny pieces or weakened versions of viruses or bacteria. They let our immune system see what the bad guys look like and recruit those all-important memory cells before we ever have to actually see the real enemy. Thanks to vaccines, the US was able to eliminate measles in the year 2000. But in recent years, as more and more parents are refusing to vaccinate their children or are vaccinating them later than what doctors recommend, it's back. In most states, more than 90% of children are vaccinated, but that's not enough to keep a disease like measles at bay. In our episode about Ebola, we talked about a number called r naught, the basic reproduction number for a disease, or the number of people infected by one person in a susceptible population. For Ebola, that number is low, but for measles, each sick person will infect up to 18 others. But luckily, vaccines can change that. The fraction of people who are vaccinated or immune can lower the reproduction number below one, which means the disease is disappearing. 90% of unprotected people who come in contact with somebody who has measles, even just breathing the same air, will become infected. To control a super contagious virus like that, the vaccination rate has to be 95% or above. And right now the US is lagging behind and measles is making a comeback. The Guardian put together a simulation of just how this so-called herd immunity works. When enough of a population is vaccinated, even if it's not 100%, the herd can protect the unprotected. With vaccine refusal on the rise, our herd immunity is breaking down. Preventable diseases like measles and whooping cough have become our scurvy. Most of us don't know anyone with polio, and I mean, measles, it's not that bad, right? Well, yes, it is that bad. Before the age of vaccines, millions of people were killed by diseases that today are just bad memories. Vaccines have let us develop a sort of generational amnesia. Today we expect our children to grow up healthy and we're lucky that we don't appreciate just how dangerous these diseases are. Like science writer Seth Mnookin says, vaccines are victims of their own success. Because of stories like Andrew Wakefield's discredited study wrongly linking vaccines and autism and the news media's obsession with pictures of crying, terrified children being poked with needles, People are nervous about vaccines. This anxiety isn't new though. 
When Edward Jenner in 1798 saw that milkmaids didn't catch smallpox, well, he realized that because they'd been exposed to the similar cowpox disease, they were immune. And based on this, he developed an early smallpox vaccine by inoculating humans with the cow virus. In fact, the word vaccine itself has bovine origins. Still, as far back as 1802, critics were claiming that the smallpox inoculation would turn you into a cow. Vaccines don't come without risk. Nothing does. But on average, fewer than one in a million people will experience a dangerous reaction to common vaccines. And car accidents, playing outside, even walking will injure more children. Vaccines are asking us to do something altruistic, to make a choice to protect not only ourselves and our children, but also those around us. Author Eula Biss says that vaccines are one of the most empathetic things that we can do, a system that's based on people voluntarily using their bodies to protect other vulnerable people. And that's something I hope we don't forget.